Good morning, everyone. Um, so good to see how many people are on this Zoom today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and welcome by Highline College. Um, I'm Eileen Yoshina. I use she and her pronouns. Um, you're going to learn much more about me, so I won't take a whole lot of time introducing myself any further, um, except to say that I, I used to work at South Puget Sound Community College. I was the Director of Diversity and Equity there for many years. Um, I am somebody who loves the Students of Color Conference, so maybe in the past have met some of you there. Um, I currently work at a place called Puget Sound Educational Service District, which serves our K-12 through um, educational system. I used to be an elementary school teacher, um, and so I'm really happy to be back in that space. And I have the, the amazing privilege and good fortune of working with Tamasha and Erika um, on one of my favorite projects of all time, which is the Educators of Color Leadership Community, which is a project that we have um, to increase and retain and support and to, to just foster the leadership of educators of color with the intention of transforming the educational system to make it um, to make it valuable and to make it empowering and to make it just and equitable for all students. So um, one of my favorite roles I've ever had, uh, and I'm so pleased to be able to be here to share with my colleagues the work that we're doing in that space. So what we are doing here today, we just want to let you know up front, this is not a keynote. Um, I don't consider my, I don't, I don't love the whole like keynote, that's not my thing is to like be a keynoter kind of person. I am a teacher. So we are here to create space to do collective wisdom sharing and to do collective envisioning. So this is not going to be so much a presentation, a keynote, as much as it is going to be a space where all of us together build the vision together for what is a just and humanizing and empowering and equitable and liberating um, education system. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? So you're going to hear us do a little modeling from our side, and then we're going to give it to you to build that space together um, in some small groups. Um, so that's just a little bit about me and about a little bit about what to expect today. I'm going to throw it over to my friend Tamasha so that she can take it to the next, the next piece. Hello, everybody. I'm grateful uh, to see so many folks' names and great pictures or videos if you have those on. Thank you. Uh, th for this slide, we're going to be talking about our home acknowledgement. I want to shout out and say I'm very gracious to hear Highline College acknowledge the, the land that they're on. And we also just want to acknowledge that we are in a virtual space right now. And so the lands that we are occupying may be different. And so what we would like to share with you all today is our home or ancestral um, lands. And so I would like to start with mine. I was born on uh, Squaxin Island and Nisqually land. And I was raised there uh, my whole life. That land gave me shelter and peace. And I want to acknowledge that the indigenous communities there uh, were stewards of the land before my family arrived. They are current stewards of the land and the indigenous communities of the Nisqually people and the Squaxin Island will be a part of those lands in the future. I keep forgetting, I need to unmute myself. Um, so I am also, I, what I, one of the things I share with Tamasha and with Erika is that um, I do also currently live in um, the land of Nisqually people, also the land of Squaxin Island people. Um, and I've lived here for many, many years and I um, need to acknowledge and, and honor and thank um, the indigenous people of this land that I share right now. Um, I also included on the slide that hopefully you can see in front of you, um, some photos of where I grew up, which is the, um, the illegally occupied kingdom of Hawaii. Um, I grew up there um, from when I was, my family's lived there for multiple generations. Um, and Hawaii is the place that nurtured and raised me. I was really fortunate to go through an educational system during a time when Native Hawaiians were really, um, uh, there was really a resurgence in Native Hawaiian um, 
values and educational styles starting to take place, which has really flourished and blossomed right now. Um, and so I was er uh, lucky and to be one of the early recipients of um, many Native Hawaiian teachers and education styles as a young child. And so um, I owe so much of who I am today to the education I received in my community in Hawaii. Hello, uh, as Tamasha and Eileen have shared, I also am on Nisqually land. Um, I also threw uh, another picture up there. I was born on Payom Kawicham lands, which are now known as the Luiseño lands on the West Coast. But home for me is where my madrecita, my dear mother is. Um, and I'm, I'm a military brat, so really home is where my, wherever my mom goes. Um, but her home are the are on the lands of the Mescaleto people, and the lands of our people are the Chiricahua. So that is the bottom left picture that you'll see with the sunbeams coming out. That is uh, not too far from my backyard where my mother is. Thank you, everybody, for acknowledging. I hope that um, in your hearts, those of you that are participating with us today, if you want to reach back and stay rooted during this time of chaos um, to the land that feels like home to you, like Erika mentioned, where you were born isn't necessarily the land that feels the most like home. It might be where your place and space is now, where you've spent the most time, where your family is from um, ancestrally, but what, whatever feels grounding and rooted, I hope that you can access that in this time of um, chaos and life on Zoom. We just wanted to let you know the flow of today. Um, as Eileen mentioned, we are not gonna have a typical sit and get situation, which will be really interesting with a large group. So um, stick with us. The, we all just completed our grounding, so great work. All of you, I'm sure, are totally grounded and feeling really great right now. Uh, up next, we're going to be talking about our authentic introductions. And um, we understand that the word authentic can be hyper used, especially when we're discussing diversity. Uh, but for what we're talking about, authentic still feels like the most correct use, use of the word. Um, afterwards, we'll be discussing abundance in our communities and bringing that abundance to education. And we hope to leave with being able to answer the question, um, what is a liberated education system like. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna introduce ourselves in an authentic way. Typically in spaces like this, our introduction sounds a lot like what how Eileen introduced herself in the beginning, our names, our pronouns, and our, our resume, right? And that, that can be a really good way to just let people know what's going on. But when we are talking in our communities and when we wanna really share story with one another, we want our introductions to be a bit more authentic. And so we are now gonna share ours with you all. Um, my, I'm gonna go ahead and start with mine. Uh, my name is Tamasha Amedi, and uh, I have a very binary family in that I'm the first person on both sides, my generation is the first one on both sides of my family to be mixed with a person from another continent. And that was really difficult um, for my family and it created a lot of disruption for many people who uh, were supposed to be caring for me. And my favorite thing to share about myself is uh, the pronunciation of my last name. As you can see next to my face, it is spelled E-M-E-D-I. And I was raised by my white mother, uh, whose family had been here for a few generations. So she's white American. And she told me my last name was Emidi, like immediately. And so growing up, that's how I pronounced my name. Uh, but then I got into more contact with my father's side of the family. And I'm now very, very tight with um, them. And when I met them and I heard them talking to each other, I heard them say Emedi instead. And so I realized that I've been saying my name wrong this whole time. Uh, but also my mom was so important to me and she raised me and took care of me and helped me become the woman that I am today that I didn't wanna let go of Emedi. 
And so I use both. When I'm being super professional, I put a medi first because I, I want to hold, hold on to the ancestral tradition of my father's family. But if you just chat with me and I'm just talking, I will, I will slip into imidi because as a child, uh, that's what I learned my name was. And so that's my authentic introduction, my story of my last name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay, I can, sorry, I, can, I gotta remember to unmute. Um, so this is a picture of my family. Hopefully you can see it. I was gonna try to put in another picture. I do not, I'm, I'm learning. I am in a learning space with technology. Um, so I was not able to put this picture in prior to showing this slide, but I do have it on my phone. So I hope you can see this. Those are my grandparents. That's my um, grandma and grandpa. Who, this is about 1930 in Hawaii. So I just wanted to show you um, from my authentic introduction. Again, a big part of who I am is where I'm from. Um, and as I shared before, you know, I was fortunate to be able to be part of a generation of people in Hawaii who were, who were starting to experience and who were really connected to land and place-based education um, in that time period. And just a huge part of growing up in Hawaii means connecting to your roots in Hawaii and to your ancestors and what it means to um, be part of a community that has lived there for a long time and to honor the people who were there before us and to um, really appreciate um, what we were what we were taught and given and shared with from the people there before us. So um, this is the photo you see on your screen now is my my dad and my mom, my sister Kathleen and my two children, my daughter Emmy and my really, really tall son Sam. Um, and they're also a part of who I am. Um, so the other, the other big thing about who I am is that I'm a teacher and I know you already know that, but um, sometimes people talk about teaching as what they do. And I think for a lot of us who, who really see education as our path forward and who really understand and understand the ways in which education can empower and liberate us and not uh, oppress us. Um, education is is who we are, not what we do. Even if I didn't work in a school or didn't work in a system, I would work somehow somewhere in a community and, and education would be a part of what I was doing in that space. I also believe that all of us are educators. So whether we get that's the work we're we're paid or employed to do or not, um, education is is what we do in communities when we pass wisdom from one generation to the next. What it means to be a good person in this world, what it means to live well in this world, um, and those are some of the things I believe in. And the picture that Tamasha has now inserted is um, from the Students of Color Conference from one of my mentors, Dr. Rhonda Coates, who I love, um, and some of my students from. Um, from a, from a past SOCC and love seeing their, their faces there. So that's a little bit about me as well. Nilte Yaate, Jigwich, Ola, salutations. Um, those are just some of the languages of my people. Um, I'm an indigenous black Irish Chicana. <laughs> I live in intersectionality um, in so many different ways as we all do. Uh, however, my ethnic, racial, ancestral intersectionality is um, something that I have been really trying to reclaim, right, as my authentic self. Um, I was a military brat and so I moved around a lot, uh, as I mentioned before. And so um, it kind of is a nice analogy of, of different intersections as well. Um, I'm a social justice equity warrior. I, as Aileen, I agree with Eileen. Um, I feel like even if I wasn't in education, that's just in my nature. Um, I am very curious about so many things all the time. Uh, and so uh, that, that is just part of, of who I am as well. Anytime I'm doing an authentic introduction, I always throw in that I'm a Harry Potter nerd. And I think that's just because 
the world in which um, J.K. Rowling created is can just be applied to so many different things. Um, it is fantasy, but there's so much that comes out of that. And, uh, you know, there are so many different cultures within that. I don't want to go on a tangent, but <laughs> um, that's definitely a big part of who I am is that and, and really just showing up as my nerdy self uh, in all spaces. And so when I come into a space, I try to bring all those intersectionalities with me. Um, and really, um, oh yeah, the, I just saw the, the picture as you can see um, when I traveled uh, to, that is the actual um, nine and three quarters platform at King's Cross Station in Europe. I was lucky to be able to go to the United Kingdom and experience that as um, something that was very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I throw those kinds of pictures in everywhere. Um, I digress. Um, I really wanted to focus on my authentic self and have been for the last few years, as I've mentioned, because in my family, um, my family kind of looks, and you can see in my picture, kind of look like the United Nations. There's so many different um, ethnicities in my family. But a lot of that was assimilating to survive, as many people of color have to go through. And so really finding, you know, the languages of my peoples that I, that I began with in the beginning um, were lost to me and were taken from me. And so I am really trying to authentically reclaim what has been taken and lost. Um, and that's part of, of who I am. Um, so next, uh, you all are going to get to practice doing authentic introductions. And it could be um, language, it could be a birth story, a home story, your name story, where you live, who is important to you in your life. Um, so really quickly, those of you who need an interpreter, if you could please send a chat, we're going to do a breakout room. And so we need to know um, who needs to be in a room with an interpreter. So if you could send that chat to uh, Tamasha, that would be great. And so uh, this first breakout is gonna be a little bit longer, take us a little bit longer to get to the breakout rooms, just because we wanna make sure that everyone who needs an interpreter gets into a room with an interpreter. After that, the next, two times that we do a breakout room, it'll go a lot smoother. So we really appreciate your patience. Um, we're giving you some think time so you can think about what your authentic introduction is going to be while all of this is happening. Eileen, did you want to share anything else while we're waiting? <laughs> um, this is something when we meet as the educators of color leadership community, um, the group is was set up for specifically for teachers, for teachers of color, because we know that there is a critical lack of teachers of color um, nationwide, specifically in our region in this um, Seattle King County area. Um, and so it's, if you're like most people and you went to school around here, you didn't have a teacher of color. Maybe you had one, maybe you were lucky and you had more than one. Um, but, but really most, most of our students who are primarily students of color um, in our region don't grow up with the experience of having a teacher of color. Um, and so when we set this group up, we knew we needed to do things differently. And one thing we always say is about bringing people of color into education is not just about the numbers. It's not just about getting more of us in the door, about getting us more, more of us in front of classroom, but it's about the actual ways in which we do things differently. What we bring is different. And so when we come together as educators of color, part of what we do is we try to practice that. So um, doing this authentic introduction where it's not just about like, my name and um, what I'm studying in school or what I do for a living is actually practice sharing who you really are is a way of actually resisting the white supremacy culture of education. Um, and so that's why we, we spend time on it and we actually consider it to be a critical practice. So keeping that in mind, 
Like, what would you share with other people if you were sharing a little bit about who, who you really are, not just what you do, but who you really are? Okay. All right, and everyone. We'll you ready? Yeah, it's going to pop up in a little box. Um, and you will also have a chat feature in the uh, room uh, if that's going to be easier for you to share. Here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I heard from many of you that the presenting was too small, and I believe I fixed it. So uh, thank you for messaging me in the chat. And also, it's great to share with um, any uh, co-facilitators that were in your small group. That was really helpful. So thank you so much. I think I should be able to fix that. And uh, we just want to acknowledge that um, what you were doing in your small groups was uh, professional development and I interrupted that. And so I apologize for interrupting the really critical work that you were doing as a group, but I promise you're gonna be with that same group soon. So if I cut you off in the middle of like a really important uh, way to connect with one another, uh, I, you will be able to finish. You might wanna jot a note down or if you really wanted to connect with someone in your group, we're not done with groups yet, so don't worry. I do believe I have fixed the share, so let me do that for you and make sure that I did that right. Check this out. You're like, it's no, you didn't. Hold on. Ah, ah. Okay. Ooh. I got ahead of myself. Okay, so you just had an authentic introduction with some folks that maybe you are familiar with or maybe might have been complete strangers. So the way in which it was authentic, of course, um, totally depends on uh, how you felt like sharing, like how deep you went. But I just wanna let everybody know that you don't have to start with like a sob story about how difficult it was to reach out to that uncle or whatever you know you can just be like my name is really beautiful and this is why so don't feel like you have to make people cry to be authentic but also if people cried good job like i love that for you um what we are going to talk about next is um what abundance looks like in our communities i want to acknowledge that when i speak to a group of people my assumption is that the I have to speak in generalities because there's more than one of us in the room. And so while I'm speaking in my generalities, uh, I'm, I'm speaking as I'm speaking to a group of, of people of color. And I know there are um, white folks in this room. And of course, this is an open and welcome space. Um, but know that I'll be centering my experience as a person of color and speaking as though I'm speaking to a group of um, people of color. And so and, and Black people and Indigenous people, people of color, uh, our communities. And uh, so when we talk about our communities and what abundance looks like, a lot of times with the lens of white supremacy, our communities are broken. There's something wrong with us. We're, we're marginalized, we're, or historically marginalized, I really like, as though the marginalization has since stopped and we are no <laughs> longer marginalized. Um, and that there's something wrong and that we need to be saved. But truly, we know that our communities are full of abundance. And so what we're going to share now is as um, people of color, as Black people, as Indigenous people, other identities that you have that feel so close to your heart, um, what abundance comes from being a part of that community. So uh, I'm going to start with... Uh, the community of folks that are, oh, whoops, the community of folks that are presenting right now. And so uh, I'm going to be sharing how I feel. Uh, hmm. I was going to share this really smoothly and elegantly. Oh, here we go. Ta da. I'd like to share about us. Uh, I am a, I'm a young person. I, I just, I'm a fresh 29. I'm an Aquarius, so maybe not as fresh, but just a few uh, uh, astrological seasons ago was my birthday. And I have felt like a leader my whole life. I got in trouble in elementary school for talking back 
all of the time. I, my teachers never could figure out the right spot for me in a seating chart because I would always want to talk to my neighbor. I led kids through um, walkouts and sit-ins through high school and college. Um, and oftentimes, if people acknowledged my leadership, they, they saw it as cute. Uh, like, oh, it's so adorable that this young woman, especially in white supremacist culture, like, oh, look, this young black woman, she wants to speak. This is amazing. How cute. Like, let's let her and then move her over so we can have our platform. And so I felt as I was becoming an adult in my late teens and early 20s that I kept being used for having a voice, but people didn't really care about what I was saying. Um, that is until I joined uh, our community through the uh, Puget Sound Educational Service District and through Educators of Color Leadership Com Community, ECLC. When I joined ECLC, Eileen, who's someone who had known me even when I was a teenager, uh, allowed me to co-facilitate very, very early on in the process. And I was nervous because I thought that this would just be like something cute, like, oh, if we let her co-facilitate, maybe she'll come back. Uh, but that's not what it was at all. I've continued to be allowed to co-facilitate and actually been a huge part of the planning um, for ECLC. And I was seeing, my leadership was seen not as something cute or something novel because suddenly a black woman is in charge, but as something valuable. And I felt the, I felt my abundance seen. And so when I'm calling out the abundance of my community, I'm calling out um, specifically like women of color and, um, our kapuna, right, our living ancestors, acknowledging us young people and giving us um, authority and giving us opportunity to, to feel like our true selves and be, be seen not just as those young kids that are so cute, but as people that can, who can step up into their power. And I, I notice it's almost always women of color first who uh, bring me into a space authentically and honestly, not because they know it is cool or the right thing to do. Okay, thanks, Tamasha. Um, and I think she, Tamasha said so many things that um, I'm, it's going to sound like an echo, but um, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it's, a, it's an amplification and an echo um, of what Tamasha said. But one of the major things we talk about in educators of color leadership community, in fact, I'm, I'm surprised she hasn't said this yet, but a phrase we often use is we've been knowing. So, um, it's, this is not about bringing like some new framing to education. It's about saying we are the only ones who have this wisdom. We have the, the necessary leadership and wisdom that it's going to take to transform our education system. If we're talking about, there's my beautiful friend, Suilan, one, um, one of my dear friends, also one of my, my dear teachers and mentors and major supporters and sisters in this lifetime. Um, but when we talk about the, the vision and the, the skill and the talent and the experience that it's going to actually take to, trans, to transform our education system into one where every student's wisdom is honored and valued um, and in which we have a truly equitable system, we're the only ones who can lead this, right? So this is not about seeing people of color as add-ons or as sort of token repre representatives within the education system. The, the transformation we are pushing for, we need to create is saying, we're the only ones who can do this. Um, we need our white allies and we need them to come along alongside us and to, to, and to hear our voices and to honor our leadership. Not an add-on, right? I see Ju in the chat <laughs> saying we're not add-ons. We are, we are the only ones who can lead this change. Um, and so for me, what abundance looks like is reframing some of those ways we've been pushed out or we've been dishonored. And so, you know, when Tamasha talks about um, being seen as sort of like cute or being seen as sort of like, oh, let's let her talk so that she, you know, doesn't, doesn't either disappear or make trouble for us. It's like, you know, some, the framing we use, some of you are maybe familiar with the, um, the term community cultural wealth. Which, which reframes the, the resilience and the wisdom of communities of color as strengths. So for, for many years, ever since the educational system was established as a white supremacist institution, people of color have been looked at as problems, right? We've been looked at as like, if we can either get them to comply or to assimilate, 
or to exclude them altogether from this education system, that's going to be typically the way education treats people of color. What we're saying is, is saying like all the ways in which people of color live and, and learn and um, know how to be with one another are the things that we need. So when, when Tamasha says, I was the first one to speak up when I saw injustice, when I saw a problem, um, rather than being seen as a troublemaker, she needs to be seen as a truth teller. She needs to be seen as the person who has the wisdom and the experience to push back on systems that are inequitable and unfair. Um, Erika is a person who speaks, who speaks multiple languages. You know, what, what do we call people in, in the education world? A lot of times what we say is, oh, that child or that student doesn't speak English. We speak about it from a deficit perspective. We don't say that child has incredible, that student has incredible linguistic abundance, incredible linguistic ability. Um, how, how does that person show the rest of us how to operate in this world? What can we learn from that person? So it's re the abundance that I see within our students of color is all of those things that a lot of times get seen as deficit by an, an, um, by an institutional system that privileges white, white supremacy, um, I see as incredible abundance. This is another picture of my family. This is generations of resilience. Um, there's my uncle who was, um, he's sort of on the, the left-hand side standing up. He was incarcerated during World War II as a Japanese American. And um, what, I say, what I say about him is that somebody who, who survived, somebody who was resilient through that experience of great injustice, somebody who became a teacher, somebody who raised future generations to have a different lens on how we see the United States and how we see law and, and the constitution and how we look out for other communities that are also impacted by um, injustice. So that's the abundance that we bring um, from my perspective. Yeah, uh, again, more amplification, more echoing. Um, and just to add on a little bit, um, you know, it's something, the, the abundance that we bring is we strive for back to the, the saying we've been knowing, right? We strive to bring in that wisdom from our elders, our ancestors, and that rich abundance of resistance um, and legacy that they're leaving for us, right? It's also about, as Tamasha was saying, you know, bringing in our kapuna, the collaboration of our colectiva or our collective to make sure that we're learning from generations past and that we're learning from the generations that are coming after us right in that community cultural wealth and so really just making it rich and bringing in all of the the wisdom and all of the you know not only the intergenerational traumas and struggles but the resistance and and wisdom and beauty that comes from all of that um so just to add a little bit of that yeah that's my my grandmother who still guides me right there's there's a saying that you might have heard my grandmother's prayers are still protecting me and that's so true she might not be with me physically here in the physical world um but she is with me she walks with me every day and her and she is protecting me and i think back to her resistance in her life and the legacy that she's left and it's something that as my authentic self, I try to bring in every day. And I try to share that with my own uh, descendants, you know, and, and my own family and the Kapuna in my life. So, yeah. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, that we did say we are going to take a break around 1150, a brief intermission. Um, but we wanted to say that we wanted to kind of tie in that it you many of us may be in a space where we can bring our abundance into education and so what we'd love you to like ruminate on and think about uh in the intermission that will start in about four minutes oh, is i'm gonna yes. interrupt quickly geo says we can fin we can finish this piece so we can have oh. people do their discussion before we do intermission okay so great. your intermissions pushed back a little bit a little bit, but we, yeah. we will keep our piece of this um, very quick. Uh, so that's my, that's my nod to my co-facilitators. Um, but we wanted to talk about ways in which we've been able to bring our abundance into education. And I just, uh, uh, before I get started with mine, I wanna reiterate something 
Eileen said, which is that um, edu educators aren't just teachers in front of students. I happen to be a classroom teacher and my job is to stand in front of 10 year olds or currently zoom in front of some 10 year olds and uh, deliver education. But an educator is anybody who has knowledge to pass on to the future. We all are living ancestors and we all are living predecessors. And so we are all part of education. Um, that being said, I do acknowledge that my, um, uh, my situation is particularly classic, uh, and so I do bring uh, my authentic self into this classic space. And uh, here's the picture I'm going to use for that. Um, this is the fifth grade team I was a part of last school year. Uh, we were the most racially diverse team in our school, and my school is uh, in the Highland Public Schools district and we our elementary school I think is the most racially diverse teaching staff um, building for elementary schools and that was purposeful work of my principal and to be perfectly honest pur purposeful work of me as well uh, shout out to everybody who has a barber also just my edges <laughs> compared to what I usually have them look like I, I am I miss my barber so much, um, but what we did as a collective is we decided a lot of times spirit weeks can be pretty problematic um, for those of us from communities that aren't uh, white. And so our, our team purposefully created our spirit week in a way that felt really uh, grounding. Uh, something that was really beautiful about my team is that um, the woman next to me and then um, the man in front or sorry, and the, the white man in the back, they both were connected to Hawaii. And then um, the man on the side, his family also felt connection to Hawaii. And so we had something like, like tourist day or like, I, I don't know, something goofy like that. And we turned it into um, ancestor day. And uh, the folks that have community in Hawaii brought Hawaiian shirts for all of us. And then our presentation to our students was about the, uh, Mauna, instead of talking about like, look at how cool this print is, right? We talked about something that's actually affecting the community that so many of the educators on our staff were a part of. And that was really important for me too, because a lot of times I feel like I have to step up and say like, as the black teacher, I wanna talk about some black stuff. Or as the African teacher, I wanna talk about some African stuff. Or as the queer teacher, whatever. But in this situation, I got to say, like, I don't have familial connection to Hawaii, but so many fifth grade teachers do that this is something our team is going to be a part of. And it, we got to bring that collectiveness together um, and ha had unity through diversity. Nice, nice tie into the Highline theme. Um, I will be try to be quick as I can, but um, I, I'll go back to the story of my uncle again. Um, so my uncle, I'm a, as a Japanese and fourth generation Japanese American. Um, I, I live, I grew up with the story of the incarceration of Japanese people during World War II. Um, and that was something I knew from a very young age. And one thing, when you grow up in a Japanese American community, the message that you get is it is our duty when we see injustice happen to anyone else to stand up against it, to say something. There's a phrase that actually means let it never happen again, which I'm not gonna remember. Some of you who speak Japanese on this maybe know how to say that. But um, I was told in English, let it never happen again. Um, and so through, in my family, the, the, I wanna say like at least half of the people you see picture there our educators, our teachers. And that was one, that was the way my family took that role um, of letting it never happen again. My, um, the auntie in the back, the two aunties standing in the back there started, they're part of a family that started um, an initiative called the Asian American um, Literature Project. And at first it was the Asian American Japanese Japanese Children's Books Project, and they, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s, they made it their, their, um, they were particularly dedicated to getting the stories of Japanese Americans into schools in California, and then that expanded over time um, to where it's now the stories of Asian American communities. They want to make sure that 
schools have access to those those stories um, all over the all over the the community that they live in. Um, so that's still running today. So that's the way in which I I I have that legacy, and that's a legacy that I bring with me into my role as an educator. Uh, and as for me, um, I, I've spoken about intersectionality and about the loss um, and the reclamation that I'm going through now because of loss due to assimilation to survive, right? But we want to do more than that. We want to thrive. And so there was a lot that was taken from me, a lot of abundance that has been taken from me. But uh, in working on my authentic self, <laughs> you can see my family again. Um, you know, we have ways of being in our families that even if something was taken from us, things will edge out, things will squeak in, right? The way that you speak, the way that you're together, the way that you're in community will come out. And so really um, to thrive in spaces that are not meant for me, right? Like that's how I bring in, in my abundance to education. Education is not it's not meant for anyone who is not white middle class with two parents, right? Um, that are that have means. Uh, it's just not. That's not how education was created. And so, really, my existence in that space is part of that resistance. Um, but thriving in that space is also part of the abundance that I bring, right? And so, doing that by telling story, right? Doing doing things that aren't done as particular way in the school system. Um, hablando Espanol, speaking Spanish. And I speak Spanish to kids that don't speak Spanish, kids that that's not part of their heritage. But you know what I also do is I learn phrases and I learn how to speak to my kids who speak Korean, who speak French, who speak to, who speak to Grinya. Um, really just, if I can show up as my authentic self and speaking Spanish to everyone, they can then bring their abundance of their own language and their own cultures, right? And so we talk about their cultures. Um, we talk about what can you teach me that I can also teach you, right? And everyone who is around gets to listen and we all become more abundant in that space. Um, and so really just playing into that authenticity and intersectionality uh, is how I bring that abundance into education. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being a part of this. It sounds like what our schedule is, and please, somebody uh, unmute and tell me if I'm wrong, is that we're going to put you back in your same groups. And then when we come back, that will be the start of an intermission. So a bio break, if you need to take one, uh, if you need to go move around or do some stretching. Also, feel free to stretch while we're talking. I, I had a lot of students dancing in the background last time I had a class, um, but we're gonna go into our small group, then intermission, and then uh, we will wrap up. Does that sound right? I'm seeing some nodding. Yes. We can awesome. Do that. Perfect, okay. So I am going to put you back in the same groups. So if I cut you off, now's your time to be like, I don't wanna talk about my authentic, uh, or I don't want to talk about my abundance in my community. I'm going to finish my authentic introduction. That's totally fine. Or if your abundant conversation kind of moves you off track and you start talking about something else, that is also fine. What you're doing in that group is critical and it can never happen again. And so please let that group grow and move in the direction that it is growing and moving. We are giving you just a box to think outside of. Okay. Well, I just wanted, I think Erica said this earlier, but to some of us are in school or live or work in places where we don't feel like it's safe to bring our abundance out. Um, if that's the case for you, we know that's real for lots of people of color. Um, then maybe imagine what it would be like, like what would it require? What kind of space would you require to be able to do that, to be able to really, um, to really be able to thrive? Okay, so also let that be one of the things you can think about talking about. All right, everybody, if you, if I click the button and you don't see something pop up, you weren't assigned to a room. So just remind me wave or something and I'll put you in a room. Here we go. Um, continue with our discussion just because the flow is just so good. I, I don't want to break that. Oh, thank you. I'm honored. And 
I just, again, I know Gio just said it, but I, it's so important to say again that um, we are autonomous human beings and we know our bodies best. So you need to go take a bio break, get out of here. Like you need to stretch, go stretch. You need to go take a nap. This is being recorded, watch it later, it's okay. The, the world right now, as we're living virtually, people do not want to honor boundaries. It's wild how much, uh, how much people above me are assuming that I have free time. Girl, my free time is taken up by Animal Crossing, all right? So if you have secretly your switch between the camera and yourself, I just did that for my last day of grad school. Yes, I see you. Don't tell anybody. Um, but also, it's fine. I trust you. I trust that you're getting what you need out of this. The point of this um, conversation, the point of what myself, Eileen, and Erika always want to say is that us being together in community is um, sacred and it is critical. This space will never happen again. And if you can't be your full vulnerable self that puts your video and audio on mute and heads like brings the camera with you to the bathroom, then what are we even doing, right? So do what you need to do. We are going to continue though with my mad screen sharing skills. Um, again, thank you everybody for the feedback. That was super helpful, um, honestly. Okay. We are here. Okay, we're here with our last big question for everybody, which uh, we kind of put in our video. Hopefully some of you saw that. A uh, very good uh, COVID social, socially distant uh, prequel video for what is a liberated edu education system like? What is a liberated education system like? And so we are gonna share our things uh, and then we invite you, um, we'll, we'll tell you about what we're gonna invite you to do later. But uh, currently what, what, what we all are going to do is share our answer to what is a liberated education system like? And so be, being super prepared with all that time, I definitely had already selected my photo. Actually, I'm gonna go back to this one. Okay. In my video response, I had talked about how a liberated education system is um, free flowing and flexible. And that's definitely true for me. But I think another thing a liberated education system has to be is patient. And uh, because even though I haven't had the opportunity to talk to a lot of you, a few of you have hit me up in the chat. And it just feels virtually like a really good vibe here. So I hope that I'm correct in that assumption. Um, but I would like to share a, a piece of uh, my coming out story and its relationship with um, the education, a liberated education system. Uh, I grew up in what the United States calls Olympia, Washington, and it is a very liberal city. Uh, we have a parade where we shut down the streets and people dress up not as uh, flora or as flora and fauna, but they're organized in elements. So like fire, water, earth, air. And you might be thinking to yourself, sorry, fire, fauna? Yes, it's incredible. You've got to come see the procession of the species sometime. But it seems like a really great town for a young gay kid to figure out that she's a young gay kid. Um, and I, I didn't, I was so, so closeted as a child, even though my mom was incredibly supportive. Um, when I told my mom I was a Christian, she was so upset because she thought I was sitting her down to come out to her. And so uh, I knew that she would be open and accepting. And uh, I had gay friends in high school. I had friends with gay parents. But even though all of that was true, and I, I grew up in this community that was so accepting of this one specific piece of my identity, the oppressive white supremacist culture existed in schools. And that is the thing that really kept me closeted because my family was totally open. The community I chose to hang out with, my friends, were all very open people. But I, I specifically remember being in middle school and looking at who I thought was my best friend and like in a moment being like, oh, I just, I think I wanna give her a kiss. And it scared me. It was, it was such a scary feeling for me as a middle schooler. And 
it wasn't anything I was explicitly taught. It was all things I was implicitly taught. And that erasing that implicit bias and, and creating a space where I don't have to be terrified of something, even though my friends and my family and this whole other community would have been okay. Um, that, that work is going to uh, take a lot of patience. And um, I also think about, I think a lot of folks that either have close um, community that belong to the um, queer, under the queer umbrella, or folks that identify as a queer or a version of queer themselves can uh, feel some empathy towards. When I did finally come out to a lot of my friends, they were like, we love you and we knew already, right? Like so many people already knew, um, but they didn't push me. Nobody was like, Tamasha, we, like just say that you're gay, like we know. Um, my community, the people that loved me and cared for me and held me and nurtured me, they didn't push me into a space I wasn't ready to be in even though it was a totally safe space for me to come out. And so that concept of, of patience of all of the queer community surrounding me growing up while I was very staunchly a straight ally, um, those people were patient and loving with me. And then when I came out, there was no, I told you so vibes. There was no um, like in your face vibes. Everything was love and uh, it was, it was incredibly beautiful. I, I'm about to tear up now. And so in my, in my belief, the thing that I reach into and as one of my communities, the, the chosen family vibe and that looking out for each other vibe, that, that belongs in a liberated education system. Um. Thank you, Tamasha. That was beautiful. Um, and for me, you know, I'm just, I was going to say something else, but now I feel compelled to build on what Tamasha said. Like, I so agree. Like, uh, to me, when I imagine a liberated education system, it's one in which no student, no matter how they identify or who they are, has to feel like they have to hide that part of themselves or feel scared that some part of them is going to be rejected because what if they just show up as who they are and to me it's so important that we have teachers like tamasha because we know those are our students as well right so if if i'm a young person and tamasha's my teacher and i'm having some questions about like who i might love or who i might be attracted to or, and all those things um, that are not represented well in media having tamasha as my teacher and having her show up as her authentic self there's nothing more powerful than that and so to me, that's really the power of having this, this space um, and, and having this community and, and encouraging, um, having us have this conversation about what it's gonna take for us to have educational systems where we say to people who share Tamasha's story, we need you and we value you and we, we wanna create a school in which you can be who you are. Um, and that is what we need you to do, not to come here and assimilate into what our idea is, but really for you to be who you are. Um, again, showing another picture of my family from the Big Island. Here they all are, family reunion. Um, and I, I think the last thing I'll just add about when I imagine a liberated education system is that the school is not separate from your community. Your community is as wise and has as much knowledge in it as anything that happens in a school system. And so for you to feel like the things that you learn in your family and in your community and in your home are as valuable, are the things that you need to live and thrive in this world and to be a good person and to create a good environment for, for future generations to grow up on, some, those things should be happening in school and in your family and there shouldn't be this, this disconnection between them. It should all be one space. Um, so that's where I think I'll leave that. Thank you both. Um, as I mentioned in the video, in my video, um, in case you have, haven't been able to see it, check it out. Um, Tamasha edited it and it's great. Um, but I spoke about intentionality and consistency in decolonization. Um, and so really for me, an, an, a liberated education system is one in which I'm intentionally doing those things. Because as I alluded to earlier, we have ways of being um that you know uh 
I, I mentioned I speak Spanish. Well, I didn't mention that I had a really traumatic um, incident happen when I was in school that, that caused me to stop speaking Spanish, which is the language I spoke more than anything for years. Um, and I'm reclaiming that back now. And that, you know, uh, is something that I can now look at as something that I resisted through and that I um, pushed through. And it, it shows a resiliency to me for that. Um, but it's, it's allowing me to, to just be in the space that I'm in. Oh, that's my beautiful mother um, who visited me here for the first time this last year. Um, but, you know, the, um, the way that it sounds, looks, and feels should be one in which we all feel like we belong, right? Um, as Tamasha was mentioning, and as Eileen said, it should be a place where, you know, we, we all feel like that is our space. And that's so true. I would agree with that as well, you know? And, and not just in a performative way, but truly feels like we really belong there. Like anything that we are, anything that, that we bring to the table is going to be okay. And not only okay, but it's going to be celebrated in that space, right? We should all be able to do that. And that's, for, for me, what a liberated education system would look like. One that belongs to the collective and everybody is there adds richness and resiliency and wisdom and beauty to it. And also, you know, I think it's important to mention that we all challenge it as well. It has to be, and as Tamasha mentioned in her part of the video, it has to be dynamic, right? It can't be static. It's something that we're always gonna push each other to be our best selves. Um, but in the way that is compassionate and really just uplifting of each other. What a beautiful, um, what a beautiful way to, to wrap that up. Thank you so much. Uh, so as Gio had said, we, uh, we were encouraging you to write down questions that come up and we invite you to share them at the end. Um, we will, there'll be a Q and A. Um, and also we had this really beautiful idea for how to end honoring the fact that we're doing this in a virtual space. So typically when the three of us or some combo of the three of us um, present, we like to end communally with either um, a call and response or uh, like a, an opportunity for us to really like stay and go meet with somebody who we felt really uh, connected to and maybe exchange numbers. But uh, that's not as possible and would certainly take a very long time over Zoom. And so we offer you um, an idea. If you check out the video um, that was posted into the chat, I would love to extend that video with any of you y'all's answers to the question, what does a liberated education system look like? So with your permission, oh, I need to send you, with your permission, I will throw in a, a Google Drive an empty Google Drive for you to drop videos of yourself answering the question. This is totally optional, um, but we thought it would be a cool way. It would take obviously a little bit longer. I'd, I'd, I'd put out the video, I'd send it to um, Gio and he could send it out in the same ways that you heard about this conference. Um, but we would love to, f to close in this way, this creative way together and this socially distant <laughs> um, way together. Uh, so I would love to have some other co-hosts unmute to understand the Q&A and looking also at the time, uh, what's, what, what next? Um, I, th I think, here's my thought, we're, we're doing this on the fly. Normally, and if we were doing a workshop with you all, we'd be like, one second, we need a little, a little co-host huddle. We're gonna, we're gonna do that with all of you listening in. So huddle. Um, I think we can still do the chat and have maybe have people just write in the chat what they were thinking and the video is also an option if people feel feel moved to do that so do you want to give direction for that that chat piece because yes. i think well you can save the chat and have this incredible thing and i've already had a couple people i'm not going to say names but i've heard some beautiful things that can go in that chat box 
Okay. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Unhuddle. Unhuddle. Okay. All right, everybody. Here's what we would love. The, uh, uh, if I could ask that the chat be opened so that folks can post um, to everybody. Uh, I'd love you to type your answer to what does a liberated education, oh, thank you, Mark. Uh, what does a liberated education system look like, right? Or what should a liberated education system look like? And so we would love it if you would type your answer into the chat. And then as an extrovert who has been just craving opportunities like this, I was wondering if there is another extrovert or someone who loves reading aloud so that um, instead of one of us reading people's answers from the chat, if I could have uh, someone from the group who'd be willing to read answers from the chat, you can tell me that you're willing either by unmuting your video and like waving. Um, Sam, did I see you do that? No, okay, sorry. Uh, so you can either do that by unmuting your video and waving uh, or doing the reaction wave or hand sign or by typing in the chat if you'd be willing to read aloud um, folks answers to the question, what does a liberated education system look like? If no one else would do it, my friend Aaron Reeder is a professional uh, speaker, actor, former poet. <laughs> I hear you throwing someone under the bus and I love it. <laughs> He's also not responding to that. <laughs> um, also, if you have any questions, you know, for our presenters, like feel free to um, unmute yourself, ask that, or use the chat features. Um, highly, highly encourage it. Encourage it. I do have some few questions for our presenters, but I'll save that later um, because I do want to um, respect um, our attendees, uh, our friends here. A liberated education system to me looks like bringing the village with you. I think liberated education should be mixed color. One quote is, I am ready to be my abundant black self. <laughs> that was great. That's my friend Isaiah liberated education system to me would allow me to bring all my identities together and be respected. Also teaching learning is reciprocal. A liberated education system is where POC students are getting support from educators with the same background and to allow everyone to express oneself. I think liberated education should represent an environment to share ideas and support one another in the positive way. A liberated education looks like including and not omitting the histories and experiences of indigenous people and people of color. I feel like a liberated education system is teaching the true history and not history as it is taught now. I feel like it is equal and equitable education for all, no matter culture, race, ethnicity, orientation, or being otherly abled. I also believe that every person should be able to bring their village with them. Liberated education system is encouraging and celebrating everyone's identities. A liberated education to me is where it is an environment where I can feel like I can say whatever I think and say without being thought of as weird. Um, also, someone wanted to include to one of the responses earlier, uh, no matter one's identity, just to kind of add on, which I think is great. The higher education system needs to be redesigned to be a liberated system. A liberated education system is affirming a student's identity and culture while also teaching a history that liberates all peoples so we can live in truth and freedom. 
a liberated education system looks like a whole shift of values that reflect the collective and most marginalized within communities, their voices, it naturally accepts a need for continuous reflection and challenges white supremacy without fragility. This is shown in resources, not just words. It supports people collaborating and sharing workloads, celebrates and shares power among all. There's no tokenization or snuffing out of voices for convenience. It's celebratory and responsive to what's happening in the wider world and our communities. A liberated education system is one free from judgment and prejudice, a place where identities from all walks of life are able to express themselves freely, where different and perspective ideas can be comfortably shared and discussed. A liberated education system is one that sees no limitation to one's full potential, where one's ancestral background is celebrated, respected, and honored. Please don't stop putting things in the chat. We are gonna stop reading them aloud, but that does not mean that your idea is not valid because you didn't type fast enough. <laughs> and so for those of you that can handle reading the chat and watching, um, please do it. And otherwise, just wait and read the chat later because there's power in those words. And I'm so, so grateful um, to hear you, um, Aaron, read those for us. Thank you, Aaron. I know I totally put you on the spot. But thank you. <laughs> um, also, I have been copying, copying and pasting uh, all your responses to a Word doc. So, and I can share that with the group. That's why I was like, okay, copy, paste, copy, paste. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are really great responses. I'm like getting chills from reading all those. I'm like, I'm over here like snapping. Um, but also like, I still want to encourage everyone, if you have any questions, you know, like I know that our time is only until 1230, but you know, time is so fluid. It's a social contract. So we can stay here <laughs> until whenever, like I had this Zoom meeting until um, whenever we can, uh, you know, finish our discussion. So right. I would like to open up the space for any questions. I also just dropped the um, Google Drive link if you want to copy and paste that geo with whatever is getting sent out. That Drive link um, is now shareable and editable. So you can drop any videos you'd like to take. And I would love to edit those together and just um, hear your literal voice or um, see your literal voice um, while you say what you said in the chat so that's an option totally optional but it's there for you yeah i will definitely do that because you know what i put my eyebrows on today so <laughs> i'll make sure that i my eyebrows get put to use <laughs> i think the the maybe in are we about to close up here or kind of say a a, a comment and if people want to have have questions they can mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much to all of you for spending your time with us today. Um, to me, the, the real brilliance of this was the, the space that we created together as a community. I know in my small group, I just loved hearing from people's um, different voices and perspective and wisdom. And to me, that's what we need. So my, my last message is all those visions that we had, all those things created, of what a liberated education system can be and should be and is, to me, it's all doable, it's attainable, and we're the people who need to do it. Um, so I look at all of you, I look at all this range of people here on our Zoom today, and I'm like, we got like, we had at one time, I think we had like 80 something plus people who, who are the leaders we need in this movement. And I thank you so much for sharing all your time and wisdom with us and so excited to see what we all create together. Uh, does anyone have questions? I do have questions for our presenters, um, for Tomasha, Eileen, and Erica. Um, higher education uh, is traditionally, or education, you know, in general, is traditionally not made to celebrate all identities. So how are you bringing, or what are some ways that you are doing in your spaces um, to encourage celebration of those identities, especially for your students? Uh, so for me, I, my education 
and like this to answer the question my education concept is public education i'm a fifth grade teacher and uh so one of the ways i do that is i talk about my historically marginalized um identities often i bring my uh, myself and i talk i talk about my idea and my perception as a black person, as a child of immigrants, as a queer person, uh, because it's twofold. One, I need my students to know that even though I'm the adult in the room, I come with these views. And so my kids who aren't black or don't have uh, immigrant parents or aren't queer or whatever, aren't girls or women, their experiences are definitely going to be different than mine. Plus, even if we share all those identities, their perceptions will be different. And so me coloring my idea of perception with my identities helps my students understand that we all come with these uh, perceptions and that they can start recognizing theirs too. Like, oh, I walk through the world as a 10 year old and the way they experience the world as 10 year olds is very different than the way I experience the world as an adult. Gio, can you restate the question one more time? I just want to make sure. <laughs> this is not my favorite, don't worry. Um, yeah, so higher uh, education in general is not tradition, it's traditionally not made to celebrate all identities. So what are some ways that you encourage uh, to, for your students to show up 100% um, or to celebrate their identities? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I think, I think Erika said this earlier, but, um, you know what, I, one of the things that I have really reflected on a lot in the last couple of years is the is um, you taking care of your own thriving is one of the most revolutionary things that you can do. And so for me, um, I ask people the question, when we go to the educators of color leadership community, we spend a lot of time talking about like, what does it mean to be your authentic self? What would it take for you to thrive? And what would it take for you to do that despite the many barriers, despite the many obstacles um, that stand in our way? Like what you prioritizing, what you need to thrive as a human being, I think is one of the most revolutionary things you can do. Um, and so um, that's something I try to encourage people to do. I know it's risky. I know it, it, it can feel scary to a lot of people when they don't have the support. One of my roles, um, where I work now is to also engage with um, supervisors and for people that work with teachers in classrooms or people that work with educators of color and and to bring this collective voice to that space as well and to really say you know like look at what your educators of color are saying and to really say if we create a school environment a, a college environment a school environment an educational environment a community where our educators are thriving our students of color will also be thriving right it's not we don't have different needs than our students do um, and so I do also try to engage with our white allies, with our, um, with our supervisors, with, with and, and we can be supervisors of color who, who have been so used to conforming and, and surviving in a system that we forget what it means to thrive ourselves. So a lot of, I think a lot of the work is internal to always be asking myself and, um, and other colleagues that I have, like, what are, what are we doing today to, to really, Help, help myself to thrive and to model that for other people around me, especially for my students. Um, because I think students are learning by watching us um, and seeing what we're, what we're doing. And if we show up unapologetically and ready to, to bring our full abundance, then they're gonna feel like they can do it too. Yeah, I would totally ag agree with the, the internal work piece. Um, I have been on this journey of really intentionally finding out what showing up authentically means to me, um, especially because I was, like most people of color, told that I had to show up a certain way and show up in this certain box, right? And so really, um, and as Eileen mentioned earlier too, it's not always easy and not, and I fully acknowledge that not everyone can do it. I got to a point where for me, it was almost suffocating 
trying to put, fit myself into that box that really there was no other way that I could show up but the way that I myself am. And so um, I've been very lucky that it's, it's mostly received. Um, it's not always received well, but really that's the only way that I can show up in a space now because I've done so much work trying to show up authentically that any other way, it just doesn't fit. And so really what I bring in is that authenticity and, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record, right? At this point of speaking in my language to anyone and everyone who is there because that's gonna show other people that one, I'm being my authentic self Two, they now have that space to be able to do that as well with their own language. Um, or three, if, even if that's not their own language, that this space is a space that I am going to make sure that that's still valid. And so really just showing up authentically, how, however that looks like in my nerdy Spanish speaking self um, is really just how I bring that into the space. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have one more question. I know, like, I, I was writing questions as you were um, presenting. Um, but yeah, but I do want to give space and time for anyone else who have might have questions. But if they don't, <laughs> I might as well ask. <laughs> um, so what is very simple, but also could be very complicated. So what pushed you into doing the work that you do right now? And what keeps you going? Uh, I became a teacher because when I turned 16, my mom said, you can get a job or move out. And so I said, job sounds better. And the position that I got was working at the after school care and the elementary school that shares a property line with the high school that I went to. And while I was there, I realized I really loved working with the kids and helping them with their homework. And so uh, when I was, as a child, I thought I wanted to go into politics and actually become president one day. Uh, mm -hmm. But the longer I uh, learned about politics, the more I was like, oh, ooh, maybe not. And so when I realized I loved working with kids, I thought, why, why don't I go into teaching instead? And those two things actually went really well together, uh, political activism and public education. And then now I, uh, working with uh, Eileen and specifically working to uh, do authentic uh, uh, work with educators of color specifically. And then I was motivated to go get my administrative certification. And so I just finished uh, my internship program and hopefully this month or next month OSPI will be sending me mm -hmm. my principal certification and that was because I realized that there's so many of us uh, that are liberation minded that are justice minded but we're stuck at these certain specific levels they're not letting us loud uh, convicted uh, like proud people of color into spaces that actually get to do bigger decision making we have to organize in this collective way like this meeting here right this was brought together in a collective group of folks that aren't necessarily in ch in charge in charge and so i want to be breaking my way into the in charge in charge spaces so that i can remove barriers because there are a lot of educators of color and uh, white allies or accomplices whichever word feels right to you um that don't want to be principals or they don't want to be deans but they do want to do great justice work and there are there are systems in place that stop them from doing the work and so my goal as i rise in the hierarchy is to dismantle the hierarchy so that you don't need to get a boss's permission or you don't need to make over a hundred thousand dollars a year to be able to do incredible work um, for the communities that you choose to serve um I became a teacher because I, I think I talked about this earlier. It's like so much a part of who I am. Um, there's my parents are both teachers. Um, I, for me, there's that real strong connection between education and social justice that we talked about. And I think of education, not necessarily as school, right, but education as like passing on of wisdom, 
to me, that is social justice. When we can do it in the way that we think is, is best for our communities, that is social justice. Um, I wanted to speak quickly to the work of, of retaining and, um, and encouraging the leadership of people of color in education because um, I, that's always been important to me, but I think for a long time I was operating on that idea of um, we just need to increase numbers, right? We'll just keep recruiting, like come be a teacher, come be a teacher. And it became real clear to me after a while that people of color get harmed working in education in the same way students get harmed, students of color get harmed by being in education because we think it's just about getting you in the door, getting you in front of the classroom. And so to me, the real work and the real transformation is going to take place when not only do we have people of color whose talents are valued in educational systems, but they, but others around them then learn from them and start changing their practice to reflect what it is that educators of color do, because they do something differently. We bring a different value, we bring a different lens, we bring different relationships into the, into the educational system that are ultimately what our students of color and our white students need. We know right now, if we, the education system right now simply replicates inequities, right? If we leave it as is, all it does is perpetuate inequity time, generation after generation. So what we, what we really need is not just to have people of color come into it bringing their lens and their history and their values and their talents, but for them to actually lead the change and to do it in a way that's humanizing, that is right for their communities. And that, to me, that's where, that's where this work is going to be truly transformative. And it really starts with all of you right here on this Zoom call. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I went into this it's really funny. I didn't know. I've always kind of been like a, a an educator, like in my space and my family, but I didn't start out like knowing that I wanted to be an educator. Um, and so I actually came to it when I was almost done with my, my degree. Um, and I stopped and changed and went into education because I was first generation, um, going to college and the that in experience in and of itself is a whole other beast um and if you don't if it's not something that you are familiar with or your family you you don't know how to navigate it um and i was able to succeed in school even though that wasn't a place for me and so the more and more i thought about it the more i realized like i want to make sure that children who are falling through their cracks um, don't do that. Don't fall through the cracks. And not only don't fall through the cracks, but succeed and are able to navigate the system. And so I went into education that way. I, I wanted it to look different um, for, you know, like I had cousins and siblings that didn't succeed, so to speak, in school the way that I did. And so I wanted them to be able to do that. I wanted no other student to have to go through a system feeling like they didn't belong and feeling like that system wasn't going to help them and they weren't going to get anything out of it. Um, so it's kind of a little, a little bit different of how I came to it. And what keeps me going is the fact that, um, that that's still happening, right? That's consistently happening. And, and um, it's, it's something that if I don't help change that system, then, then who is right? There's, everyone here that's who's gonna help right but that's something for me that i said i have to be a part of that system to change it so that this doesn't continually happen it's not perpetuated and it changes all right thank you um again i would like to thank all three of you for blessing us with your knowledge and your experience um you know being in the space virtual space with us um, I think I will just conclude that our program is over for today. Um, but before we all go, I would like to thank everyone for being here in our virtual shared space. Um, definitely shout out to our Unity Week um, planning committee. Uh, I don't have everyone's name on top of my head, uh, but I'm sure it is somewhere, you know. But Doris, uh, if you have some, if you would like to say something to conclude our Unity Week, our 
23rd annual Unity Week. You know, um, I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. Um, Tomasha, would you be able to unmute um, Doris? That would be great. Oh, there you go. Thank you so much, Tomasha. Okay, Doris. Wow. Can, I, can everyone hear me? Yes. Wow. Um, can y'all just like throw some love on the chats just for our amazing, incredible presenters? Um, yes, I that that was feeding to the soul <laughs> on so many levels. And I could not have thought like as our committee, when I think back to our programming um, that we've been doing, brainstorming, planning since February of a better way to end or conclude our week reclaiming education honoring resilience like that was our theme for the week and y'all just really brought your your love your i felt our ancestors of all spaces gathering here today virtually and it's it was just so beautiful so on behalf of the unity week planning committee um i see a few folks here i can't begin to thank y'all so much to everyone the 26 people that are still here um show you know sharing space with us even though this is Passover <laughs> but time is a social construct I feel you Gio um <laughs> but you no know, I really do thank y'all so much for being here this was the first time in the 23 year history of Unity Week that we've done it all virtual um and so I want to especially give a shout out to our amazing Unity Week committee um you know this isn't done without uh, the collective as um, what Tamasha said earlier and what everyone has said. And I'm just so grateful to everyone who has been a part of planning this. So um, Sean McFessel, Betty Vera, Diego Luna, Gio Marcanello, Shannon Waits, Edwina Fui, Bob Scribner, Georgia Piri, Marlena Ferretti, Saini uh, Vuli. Thank y'all so much. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I have nothing else to say. I'm just full of gratitude. And to, of course, our team, um, Center for Leadership and Service, the Learning Teaching Center, of course, you know, Student Services, always supporting us. Dr. Mosby, our president of the college for sending out a message, encouraging folks to come and attend this. Um, this is all done as a village. And of course, um, Erika, Tamasha, Eileen, um, Thank y'all so much for closing us out. This has truly been an honor. And Gio, thank you for being such an incredible host and bringing this presentation to us. Um, couldn't have done it without you. So that's all I have to say. Thank y'all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Major shout out to Highline College for, for adaptation to these <laughs> circumstances. But thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. Uh, enjoy your lunch, everyone. A recording of this uh, workshop will be available. I don't know when, but I'm hoping it'll be available. It'll be available in about a week and a half or so. We're going to be getting the videos closed captioned. And then after that, we will go ahead and upload them onto our Highline College Center for Leadership or Center for Cultural Inclusive Excellence um, playlist. So I'll send that out. It'll be on the Facebook. It'll be on our Instagram. And one more person I wanted to shout out, big ups to Mark Lentini. Yes, Mark. <laughs> Design honorary member of our <laughs> Unity Week committee. If it wasn't for Mark um, being here, giving us tutorials on how to run the Zoom experience. Um, and a shout out to Access Services, our amazing um, ASL interpreters that have been with us all week. Um, and a special uh, shout out as well to our ITS um, department for helping us out with technology. Without y'all, this would not have been possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Mil gracias to everybody. Yes, Mark is the MVP. So big ups to oh. Mark. And Bob Heyer. Blushing over here, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> to our brother Bob Heyer as well from Multimedia Services. So he'll be working on the closed captioning and getting all of that together. So that way our videos are legit, nicely edited for everyone.